Okay, so welcome back everybody to week two of this uh, introduction to OpenMP. So for the first session this afternoon, I'm going to be looking at parallel regions. So remember from last time, the parallel region is the basic parallel construct uh, in OpenMP. And that's the only way that we get multiple threads executing. So and whenever we want to do anything interesting in parallel in OpenMP, we always need a parallel region to create the multiple threads that can execute in parallel. Uh, and if you also remember from last time, the, the way it works is that the code within a parallel region is executed by all the threads. So the master thread starts executing the program initially on its own. When it reaches the first parallel region, it creates a team of threads. All the threads then execute the code inside the parallel region. So we already saw uh, this syntax a little bit uh, from, from last time. Uh, so uh, for Fortran, the parallel region looks like exclamation mark dollar OMP parallel, followed by a block of code, which is what all the threads are going to execute, uh, and then exclamation mark dollar OMP end parallel to close the block. In C and C++, it's hash pragma OMP parallel, uh, and then a block of code in curly braces. Um, so just a couple of little points about this C, C++ syntax. So strictly speaking, what comes after the OMP parallel directive is actually a, a C structured block. Um, so that means that it could be just a single statement, or it could be a block of code in curly braces. Um, However, I, I strongly recommend that even if your parallel region does only contain one statement, that you always use the pair of curly braces. Otherwise, it's easy to uh, add code, add another line of code to your parallel region. Uh, forget that it's uh, the parallel directive only applies to the following statement if you don't have the curly braces there. Um, the other thing which is slightly annoying is that the opening curly brace has to go on a new line after the hash pragma OMP parallel directive. So, um, and that probably goes against the kind of uh, formatting style that most C and C++ programmers are used to, which is, you know, for example, for, uh, for for loops or for if blocks, is to put the opening curly brace uh, at the after the for or if statement. But in for OpenMP, that doesn't work. You can't put the opening curly brace on the end of the hash pragma OMP parallel directive. Um, the reason for that is that the, uh, the way that uh, the compilers work is that they have to be able to parse the code correctly without the OpenMP directive. So that means that the opening brace really has to come on the, on the following line. Okay. So as usual, uh, for last week, uh, please, if you have questions, um, please type them into the, into the chat box you can find uh, by clicking the uh, opening the the panel on the on the uh, the bottom right hand side of the collaborate window okay so again here's a here's a simple example so in the, what I'm showing here is that so I have a uh, an OpenMP program. So the uh, master thread executes 
the function Fred to begin with, because that's outside a parallel region. Only the master thread executes that. We then have a parallel region whose body contains a call to the function Billy. So uh, in this case, I've, I've shown four threads in total. So that's the master thread plus three new ones. They all execute Billy. At the end of the parallel region, the master thread waits for all the other threads to hit the end of the parallel region. And then the master thread carries on on its own again and execute. In this case, it's going to execute function daisy. OK, so um, until we get into parallel loops and work sharing directives, if we just want to write useful code with parallel regions, and we can do that, there's nothing to stop us doing that. And sometimes that's, that's a genuinely useful thing to do. Then in order to be able to, to usefully use parallel regions on their own, we need to know um, some information. Um, so in particular, we need to know which thread is executing and how many threads are, are there. So for this, we have a, some of the runtime library functions. So in order to find out the number of threads being used inside the parallel region, we can call this function omp underscore get underscore num underscore threads. So the way we get access to the runtime library functions in OpenMP, so in, uh, in Fortran, there's a predefined module called OMP underscore lib. So whenever we want to use the OpenMP library functions, we have to have the use OMP lib statement in, in, in our file. And similarly for C and C++, C++ there's a standard header file called OMP.h. So we have to hash include OMP.h to get the uh, to get the prototypes for the for the OpenMP library functions. Okay. The semantics of this call really are how many threads are currently executing this block of code. Okay. So if you call this, you can call this function from outside parallel region on the master thread, and that's fine but that will just return one. So um, that's maybe not what you want. So there, there, is, uh, there are other ways of getting hold of um, something which looks more like, you know, I'm the master thread, how many threads will execute the next parallel region? Um, there is a way of getting that, or is that there is at least a way of getting an upper bound on that. Um, but it's not this function, okay? So this, this is really how many threads are currently executing. So it returns, if you call it inside a parallel region, it's, uh, it returns the number of threads in the team. If you call it from outside the parallel region, it, it returns one. And then there's also a function which allows us to find out the number of the executing thread. So this function is called OMP underscore get underscore thread underscore num. And those, the two names for these two functions are a little bit too similar. So just be careful that you don't get them confused. So that wasn't, probably wasn't the greatest design choice in the, uh, in the naming convention in OpenMP, but we're stuck with it now. So thread numbers start from zero. So this takes values from between zero uh, and one less than the number of threads in the team. So one less than what OMP get num threads will return. So that's fine. The only gotcha here is that if you are a Fortran programmer, and you ever use the thread ID to index an array, you have to remember that thread numbers start at zero, whereas array indices start at one by default. <laughs> 
So there's a, there's a, there is a potential gotcha there for, for Fortran programmers. Okay. So in addition to the basic directive, we can specify some additional information and some additional control through clauses. So this is extra pieces of syntax which appear on the end of the parallel directive. Um, so we, uh, it's possible to have multiple clauses uh, and they can either be comma or space separated. That's um, your choice. So in particular, one of the things that we can do with these clauses is to declare whether variables are going to be shared or private inside the parallel region. So just to recap, inside a parallel region, variables can either be shared, where all threads see the same copy, or private, where each thread has its own copy. And there's a couple of other options which we'll, which we'll cover later on. So this is done through shared, private, and also default clauses, which appear on the end or after the, the parallel directive. And so in, in either Fortran or C, we can, we can have a list of shared variables. So that's a comma separated list of variables uh, in the shared clause. So we say shared, open brackets, and then comma separated list of variables, close brackets. Uh, and similarly for private. And we can also control the default behavior. So if there are variables which, are, are, which appear inside the parallel region uh, and they're not listed in uh, the shared list or the private list or one of the other options which I, which I will come back to, then they, their behavior comes from the default clause. Um, so in Fortran, I can say either default shared or default private or default none. Uh, in C and C++, for arcane technical reasons, it's not possible to specify default private. So your only choices are, are shared or none. Okay, so a little bit more about shared and private data. Private variables, so variables that appear in the private list, what happens is that every thread gets a new copy of that variable. Uh, and on entry to the parallel region, those copies are uninitialized. Any variables that are, this is really a C or C++ thing, any variables that are declared inside the scope of the parallel region are automatically private. So things that appear in the shared and private clauses must be variables that are currently in scope where the parallel region directive appears. So things that are declared inside the parallel region are not in scope at that point, so they cannot appear in shared or private clauses. Um, so the rule is that those things are automatically private. Those private copies really are separate storage from the original variable which existed in the master thread. And after the parallel region ends, the original variable is unaffected by any changes to the private copies. So we can assign values to the private copies uh, by, by all the threads or some of the threads inside the parallel region. But after the parallel region exits, the, what we see in that variable is the original storage uh, and its value has not changed from the value it had when we went into the parallel region. 
So for C++ programmers, this stuff all works with objects. So you can have you can list objects in the private or shared clause. Private objects are so every thread gets a new copy, uh, and those are created using the default constructor for that class. Now, the next point is really important, and if you take my advice here, I can guarantee that you will save yourself some serious pain and unpleasantness at some point in your life as an OpenMP programmer. Okay. If you do not specify a default clause, that's the same as specifying default shared. So if you don't put a default clause on your parallel region, then any variables which are not explicitly listed in one of these clauses are shared by default. And I've, this is unfortunately extremely dangerous because that is a recipe for having unintended sharing of variables and consequently race conditions and consequently non-deterministic behavior. So I can't recommend this strongly enough, even though it might seem uh, a bit tedious and means that you have to type in lists of variables, always use default none. Okay? So whenever you, uh, ever you code a parallel region uh, in OpenMP, put default none on there, force yourself to list all the variables which are accessed inside the parallel region in one of these data, data attribute sharing clauses and then forces you to think about all the variables. Most compilers here are pretty good. If you specify default none, uh, and you fail to list a variable, the compilation will fail with an error, and compilers are generally good at producing error messages. So it will, the compilation will fail, and it will tell you that uh, uh, variable uh, foo was, was, uh, was not declared in, in, in any data attribute scoping clause. Um, so, use the compiler uh, error, error checking facilities there to, to, to make sure that you caught, you caught everything. Okay, um, so let's just look at a really simple example here. So this is a, 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 an example in Fortran. So what I want is, okay, I uh, suppose that I have a two-dimensional array and I want, to, I want each thread to write some values to initialize uh, a different column of that array. Okay, so I want thread zero to, to, to write the first column, thread one to write the next column, it's the red column on the, uh, in the diagram on the right-hand side here, and thread two to, to write the, the blue column and so on. Okay. So I, I need a parallel region. Okay. So I have my, my parallel and end parallel pair of directives. And so the code inside will be executed by, by every thread. So let's just uh, look through. Um, So, uh, oh yeah, good, very good question. Okay, so if default none is important, would it not make sense to make it standard? Um, so the answer is, I believe that would have been the correct decision uh, in, in OpenMP. Okay, um, unfortunately it was not, and, uh, and fixing that would, would break so much code that uh, and it would make uh, so much code not back, you know, make uh, OpenMP not backwardsly compatible with so much code that unfortunately we're stuck with it. Um, I, I seriously think that, you know, if you, uh, it, was, it was a really poor decision and, and with hindsight, um, 
uh, default none should have should have been the the default behavior yeah absolutely okay um yeah so inside the parallel region okay so i want every thread to to get its uh, get its id so every thread calls omp get thread num uh and because i'm going to index a fortran array i'm going to add one to it um, uh, and then every thread can uh, loop over its column okay so loop over the the n elements that, that comprise that column of, of of the array okay so what do we need in terms of variables here okay so i took my own advice i specified default none so uh what about the different variables here okay so my id so ev for sure for this to make sense every thread wants its own copy to store my id in so that goes in the private list and then every thread needs to have its own copy of the loop iterator i and that's maybe a little bit less obvious um but uh yeah every thread really wants to every thread really needs its own its own copy of that in order to make sense okay because what the the implicitly loop in in that loop the, that there is you know there could be some something stored there and and incremented every time you go around the loop and we wouldn't want a, a race condition now for fortran uh loop iterators are a special thing so uh loop iterators in fortran are always private by default um it's okay to also explicitly list them in the in a in the private clause um that's fine but you don't need to they are they are always private by default um Loop iterators are not special objects or uh, special entities in C or C++. They're just regular old variables. So you do need to declare those inside the private clause for, for C or C++. Okay, so uh, question. This example, the variables in the clause are all caps, main body, they're lowercase. Yeah, that's a Fortran thing, okay? So Fortran doesn't care about is, is case insensitive. In C and C++, then yes, the variable cases have to match. So then the other variables we're dealing with here okay so a is the array we're going to write values into um so uh so it's okay for uh for for that to be shared there is no race condition here because the uh the different threads are going to write to different parts of the array so 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 that's fine and then the last um variable we have to deal with here is n which is the number of iterations in the loop and so that can also be shared okay so in fact it would be incorrect to make it private because that would then be an uninitialized value so uh, as a general rule if uh, if variables are not modified if they're not written to inside the parallel region then it's fine and sensible to make those things shared so the, you know, there's no need to make private copies of variables which are not going to be modified okay um a bit of technicality here so because i'm because i'm insisting or <laughs> at least encouraging you to to write lists of private and shared variables that means that your directives might get a bit long and you want to split them across multiple lines so in fortran this depends on whether you're in fixed or free source format 
Um, so in fixed source format, you split the directive by having uh, the second line and subsequent lines of your directive start with exclamation mark dollar OMP ampersand right, to, as a continuation line. In free source form, the ampersand goes on the end of the first line uh, and then and, and not on the second. Um, in practice, doing both usually works. Okay, so having the ampersand in both places um, will compile for both both source formats. C and C++, it's the normal way of extend of uh, continuing a uh, preprocessor line. So that's to put a backslash at the end of the line uh, and then carry on on the next on the on the next line. Um, the usual gotcha here is that you cannot have any white space after the backslash. Um, that will cause the compilation to fail. So I mentioned that apart from shared and private, there are a couple of other options um, for, for, for the uh, data scoping of variables. Um, one of these is to be able to initialize private variables. So we mentioned already, private variables are, are by default uninitialized at the start of the parallel region. Um, if we want to initialize them uh, and initialize them with, with, in other words, initialize them with the value that that variable had at the point where the master thread encountered the parallel region directive, we can use the first private clause instead. So instead of private, we can say first private, uh, and that causes those variables, again, to get, for every thread to get a private copy but it will be initialized with the value of that storage that existed on the master thread when, we, when it encountered the parallel region. Um, in fact, in practice, this, uh, this kind of sounds really useful. Um, in practice, use cases for this are actually uncommon. So um, you should, uh, if, you're, if you're tempted to use this, then you should just think, just think twice and convince yourself that you really need it and you really mean it um, because it's, uh, it's relatively uncommon to, to need it. Um, and again, this works for C++ objects. Uh, and in this case, it's the default copy constructor that will be called to create and, and initialize the, the new object. So here's an example. Um, it's a bit contrived. Um, so what you can do here is, okay, suppose I have a, uh, a variable B, which is assigned a value by the master thread. So in this case, we have uh, the master thread assigns the value 23 to B. Um, so then when I enter the parallel region here, uh, I declare B as first private. So every thread will get a private copy of B, which will be initialized to the value 23 uh, on entry to the parallel region. Uh, and then every thread can then use that value. So in this case, I'm accumulating some, uh, some elements of this array C into, into B. Um, so Every thread can can use that, and it's it's already initialized, so um, it can accumulate into that or, or into that without assigning anything else to it. Um, and then uh, at the end of the parallel region, it's going to it's going to use that. It's going to write that value into some other element of this this array. Uh, and then uh, at the end of the parallel region, those private copies disappear, and what we're left with. So on, on the master thread, 
we are left with the original value. So if we then went and read the value B on the, on the master thread after the parallel region, that would still have the value 23, regardless of what happened in, inside the, the parallel region. Okay, and so our final option here, so we've had shared, private, and first private. So the final option that we can have for specifying the behavior of variables inside parallel regions is reductions. So uh, if you remember, so reduction is one of these operations that produces a single value from things like addition, multiplication, maximum, minimum, logical and, logical or. So, uh, and this is the case where we would like each thread to accumulate uh, a partial result into a private copy uh, and then have those reduced together uh, at the end of the parallel region to give the final result. So, this can uh, all be done automatically by using the reduction clause. And so this is like the shared private and first private clauses, except as well as a list of variables, we also ne need to specify the operator that we want to use to combine the values at the end of the parallel region. Um, so syntax is, is, is basically the same in, in Fortran and C++. So reduction clause, um, so we have to specify the operator first, followed by a colon, uh, and then a list of variables. If you have, um, say, two variables that require different operators, then you need two separate reduction clauses with, with different operators. So you can only have one operator per reduction clause, but you can have as many different reduction clauses as you like. Um, so reductions are quite natural to think about if you think about scalar variables. Um, we can also do this with arrays, but just have to think about what does that mean. It means that the reduction operation is applied individually to every element of the array. So we start out with an array, every thread gets a private copy of the array, uh, and then what happens at the end is for each element in the array, the, for, if it's, a, an, if it's a, an addition, say, then um, the sum of those corresponding elements is put into the, into the, into the final array. So it doesn't form, an, uh, it doesn't form a, a scalar sum across the array. Okay, so um, the, the output is, is still an array here. Um, so that works straight off in Fortran. You can just list arrays in the, in, in the list of variables here. In C and C++, um, we basically have to use a special, special syntax which allows us to specify array sections. Um, so the problem here is that um, uh, for dynamically allocated arrays in, in C or C++, the compiler cannot determine the extent of those things. So you have to have some special syntax which, uh, which allows, the, uh, allows us to specify the, basically the start point and the extent of the, uh, of the array that's being used like this. Okay, so yeah, here's an example here. Okay, so um, for a parallel region where I declare this variable, scalar variable B as a addition reduction. So I say hash, say exclamation mark dollar OMP parallel reduction plus colon B. So what happens is so, okay, so um, B already has some initial value. It needs to be initialized before we get to the parallel region. 
because we, we, we have to have a valid value in the original variable before we start. That essentially gets saved and remembered. Okay. So we remember the original value, remember the value of the original in the original variable. Every thread will then get a private copy of B. And because it's an addition operator, those copies will be initialized to zero, which is the identity element for addition. Um, so the initialization value depends on the operator. So it's zero for addition. It would be one for multiplication. Uh, for max, it will be um, minus the largest representable number in the type. For min, it'll be the largest representable number in the type and, and so on. So the initialization value depends on the operator and it's the identity element for the, for the operator. All the accesses to that variable inside the parallel region refers to those private copies. So there's no way of getting access to the original copy when you're inside the parallel region. They behave just like regular private variables in that respect. And there's no restriction on what you can do with that. I mean, if it's probably if it's an addition reduction, then it really only make probably is only going to make sense to add and subtract to those things. But there's no you know, the OpenMP doesn't care what you do in there. Okay, um, it's not going to check that you're doing anything sensible. So you can modify those private copies in, in any way you like. But at the end of the parallel region, the values of all those private copies are added in to the original variable. So what you get out at the end is whatever that was there to start with, in this case, the value 10, plus the sum of all the private copies. Uh, and that's what will end up in, in B, which will then be visible and usable uh, by the master thread uh, after the parallel region ends. Okay, um, so first proper, uh, so uh, after you've done the hello world example, just to get yourself going, um, the, so the first real example that uh, I'm giving you to work with in, in, in the practical sessions um, is essentially to uh, a, very, a very trivial little program which estimates the area of the Mandelbrot set. So. Uh, the Mandelbrot set is a you know, well-known well fractal um, that's uh, sort of picture in the bottom, bottom here. Um, so um, perhaps surprisingly, it does have a well-defined area, even though it has a, a fuzzy boundary. Um, and what we're going to do to estimate the area of it is basically draw a box around it uh, and put a grid of complex numbers in, in the box. Uh, and then for each of those points in the box, I'm going to test to see whether it belongs to the set or not. Uh, and then the ratio of the points inside to the total number of points uh, multiplied by the, uh, the area of the box gives us an estimate of the, of the area of the set. Um, so this is a nice trivially parallel problem in the sense that the testing of points is independent. Dependent. So we can use a parallel region uh, and have multiple threads. So divide up the points between the threads and, and, and get some parallelism. Okay. So for this, you will need, uh, you need a, a parallel region. You'll need to uh, find out how many threads there are. You'll need to find out the thread ID. You need to compute which subset of points each thread is going to is going to operate on uh, and then you also need a reduction variable to count the number of points uh, and get the sum of that over over all the threads okay um does anybody have any questions
So the question is, a private private public clause applies to only variables on the stack or, and what a heap? No, uh, it applies to to uh, to to all variables. Okay, you can make make uh, make private copies of 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 of, of anything. Okay. Um, you have to be a little bit careful about what you're what you're making private copies of, though. Um, if it's uh, if the especially in 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 C or C plus plus, okay. So if it's a dynamically allocated heap storage, then what you're making a private copy of is just the pointer. So if you then want private copies, uh, you then need to, every thread would then need to allocate storage um, and, and assign it to that pointer. Okay. Um, Fortran's a bit different. So uh, if you have allocatable arrays, then, and you declare an allocatable array of it, that will automatically do the allocation for you. Okay, great. So we'll take a break and we'll resume again at, uh, at half past the hour. And I'll talk about, uh, about work sharing in the second session this afternoon. Okay, welcome back everybody. So in this session, I'm going to be talking about work sharing directives. So what are these things? So these are directives which appear inside a parallel region and indicate how work should be shared out between the threads. So by default, inside a parallel region, every thread executes the whole block of code that's inside that's inside the parallel region um, so that's fine and that's powerful and you can do pretty much anything you like using parallel regions but um, as you'll discover if you do the uh, first exercise with the mandelbrot set it's um, it's slightly inconvenient if you want to divide up the work in a loop between different threads to have to explicitly get the thread ID and then calculate how or which loop iterations each thread is going is going to do. So that's perfectly possible, um, but it's uh, it's a little bit ugly. Um, so I'm going to be talking about how. Uh, we handle parallel do or for loops in, in OpenMP. Um, and then a, a couple of other things which, which sort of come under the same idea. Um, so this is cases where we're inside a parallel region and we actually have a piece of code where we want, we want only one thread to execute it and not all of them. So single directive and master directive uh, are ways of doing that. So as I mentioned last week, uh, loops are really important because uh, particularly in scientific codes, they tend to be the most common source of parallelism. So parallel loop directives are, are therefore uh, very important. And in practice, this is what most people tend to end up doing with, with OpenMP is parallelizing loops. So a parallel loop is just a, uh, a, way, a way of saying what we're going to do is we want to divide the iterations of the loop up between threads. Uh, and so have uh, different threads executing different subsets of the iterations of the loop. So to do this, we use some of the loop directives. And this appears inside a parallel region and indicates that the work in the loop should be shared out between the threads instead of replicated. Okay? So if we just had a loop inside, a plain loop inside a parallel region, every thread would execute all the iterations of the loop. So instead, what we'd like to happen is that the loop iterations get divided up between the threads so that each iteration only gets executed once 
by, by some thread. When we do this in OpenMP, there is an implicit synchronization point at the end of the loop. So all threads must finish their set of iterations before any thread can proceed past the end of the loop. Um, that's the default behavior. There is a way to change that, to get rid of this synchronization point if you want to. And uh, we'll talk about that um, later on in the course. I think in, that'll be in week four. Okay, so the syntax is uh, quite straightforward. So for Fortran, we have exclamation mark dollar OMP do, uh, and then potentially some clauses immediately followed by a do loop. Um, the end do directive is optional. Uh, so the compiler is able to figure out for itself where the do loop ends. Um, but uh, if you like, tidiness uh, and having all your Fortran OpenMP directives with a matching end directive, then it, uh, it can look so neater and, um, and um, a bit more readable to, to use the end do directive, but you don't need it. C and C++, it's hash pragma OMP4, uh, again, with potentially some clauses on the end immediately followed by the for loop. So uh, in particular here, another uh, common syntactic mistake here is to put a set of curly braces around the outside of the, uh, of the for statement. Uh, so that won't work. It has to be the actual for statement must be the next line after the uh, OMP4 directive. Now this works with any old Fortran do loop, um, but for simply C++, there are some restrictions on what we're allowed to do here. Because it, actually a for loop in C is really, a, is really just a, uh, a special syntax for a, for a general while loop. There are some restrictions on the form it can take. Um, so really the, uh, the, the um, intent of these restrictions is uh, that the uh, runtime, the number of iterations in the loop, so the trip count of the loop has to be determinable before the loop starts executing. Um, so that means it has to be the kind of generic form that you probably all think of when you write a for loop anyway, but it has to look like this. So for some variable equals some initial value, uh, then the test is variable less than, less than or equal, greater or greater than to equal some, some other value, and then an expression where that's uh, an increment expression, okay? Um, so it looks like var equals var plus or minus something, or the usual semantic equivalent such as, such as var plus plus. And the other restriction is that you're not allowed to modify the loop iterator, list loop iterator variable inside the loop body. Okay, so here's a sort of canonical example in uh, in both languages. Uh, so both in Fortran on the left, C, C on the right. So um, so we look at this loop then uh, so whichever version you want to you want to consider then we can see that uh, this is a parallel loop in the sense that its iterations are independent doesn't matter what order we do them in so in order to just to emphasize here in order to get multiple threads we need the parallel region uh, and then to make sure that the loop is divided up between threads and not replicated across all the threads, then we use the, the loop directive, so the do directive in Fortran or the for directive in C, C++. Okay, 
So this pattern, so to add on this previous slide here, so this pattern of uh, parallelizing a loop where we have to have a parallel region and a work sharing loop directive. So this is such a common pattern that there's a shorthand form uh, provided which combines both the parallel region and the loop directive into a single line. So you can express that as in a single line directive so in, as, as OMP parallel do or OMP parallel for immediately followed by the do loop or the for loop. Um, so this directive both creates the parallel region and indicates that the iterations of the loop be shared out between the threads. Okay. A few things to note about this. So the work sharing directive can have private, first private and reduction clauses, which just refer to the scope of the loop. Um, private and first private is unusual, not very commonly used. Um, the loop iterator itself is always private by default. Okay. So the parallel loop iterator is always private by default. But as we talked about earlier, other loop indices are private default by default in Fortran, uh, but not in C or C++. The work sharing loop can also have a reduction clause on it, and that is a more useful use case because it's uh, it's not unusual to have a loop, a parallel loop inside a parallel region, and you want the result of the reduction available in the rest of the parallel region. So you really do want the reduction operation to happen at the end of the parallel loop rather than at the end of the parallel region because you want the result of the reduction available to all the threads in the remainder of the parallel region. So having a reduction clause on a parallel loop is a uh, is quite a is a reasonably common use case. Okay. But you know, just when you are starting out with OpenMP, this can be a little bit confusing. Um, so just be aware that you know the combined loop directive is not the same as the loop directive on its own and nor is it the same as the parallel directive on on its own okay so the parallel do for is the combination of a parallel region with a loop sharing a a loop directive inside it so as long as you remember that then that's all okay Okay, so question that might, you, might occur to you is, okay, so we're dividing the loop iterations between threads. How does that happen? Okay, There's lots of choice here. Um, so uh, if we don't have any additional clauses, then the loop directive will partition the iterations as equally as possible between the threads. Um, so of course, this, you know, uh, that's, doesn't quite nail it down because there might be some remainder. The, uh, the, the number of threads may not equally divide the number of loop iterations. So um, there's, there's still a little bit of uh, a little bit of information dependent ambiguity there as to what happens. So suppose we had a loop with seven iterations and three threads, then it, it, that could get split up as uh, three iterations and three iterations and one iteration on the third thread or as three and two and two. So you don't know. Um, in practice, most implementations tend to do the first thing, okay? So they tend not to try and spread out the remainder between threads. They, uh, they just truncate it. Um, so you tend to get, you would typically get 331 rather than 322, but the, the OpenMP standard doesn't, doesn't specify which of those you're going to get. In practice, that really doesn't matter. It's uh, almost always a good idea 
to um, to write code so that you are not depending on exactly how the iterations get mapped to threads in any case because you, you want to write code that's uh, that's independent of the number of threads um, so it makes sense not to not to write code that depends on 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 the precise details of the mapping okay so that's the default behavior uh, if we want to change that then we have available the schedule clause which gives us a variety of options for specifying how the loop iterations are divided up between between threads and the syntax for this is schedule and then in brackets a kind where kind can have one of these values, static, dynamic, guided, auto, or runtime, uh, which we'll come and talk about in a moment. And some of those kinds also have an, uh, an optional parameter, which is the chunk size, uh, as which is a, a positive, positive integer value. So for example, we could say something like OMP do schedule dynamic four. Uh, so that would be a that would be a valid schedule clause, and uh, I'll explain in a moment what what that what that means. So let's start off with the static schedule. So um, if we don't specify a chunk size, then that's the same as the default behavior. The iteration space is going to be divided into these approximately equal chunks. So, you know, approximately modulo any remainder, and then one chunk is assigned to each thread in order. Okay, so if you like, think about it this way, it's a, it's a block schedule, We're just dividing up the iteration space into, into equal chunks and giving one chunk to each thread. So that, that's just the, uh, the same as the, the default behavior. If we do specify a chunk size, then what happens is that the iteration space is divided up into chunks, each of that number of iterations, and then those are assigned cyclically to each thread in order. So this is a this is a block cyclic schedule. So this is perhaps easier to see with a with a diagram and an example. So okay, so my example here is, is suppose I have a loop with 46 iterations and I have four threads. So if I specify schedules as static, then I will divide the loop up into one chunk per thread. And so that will be 46 divided by four. So most threads, well, the first three threads will have most likely 12 iterations and then the thread three will have the remaining 10. I specify a chunk size, so on the bottom here, I specify a chunk size of four, then I divide the, up, the iterations up into chunks of four. So thread zero gets the first four, one gets the next four, and so on. And then we cycle round. So after thread three, four iterations, then we go back to thread zero again, and we keep cycling around until we get to the end. And again, if uh, if things don't divide nicely, then the last chunk may be, may be smaller. So next is dynamic schedule. So dynamic schedule divides the iteration space up into chunks of chunk size again. So, uh, but instead of this static, predetermined order cyclic order what happens is that these will get assigned to threads on a first come first serve basis so as soon as a thread finishes a chunk it's assigned to the next chunk in in the list and in this case if we don't specify a chunk size then it defaults to the value one so uh, the iterations will be uh, assigned one at a time to threads on a first come first serve basis. So the first thread to finish its iteration will, will pick up the next one from the, from the list. Okay. 
The next option is called guided schedule. So this is similar to dynamic in the sense that it's also a first come first served policy. But instead of having all the chunks the same size, the chunks start off large at the beginning uh, and then get, to get exponentially smaller and smaller as we go towards the end of the loop. So the way this is defined is that the size of the next chunk is proportional to the number of remaining iterations divided by the number of threads. And the OpenMP standard does not specify the constant of proportionality, um, but all implementations that I know of, the constant is 0.5. Okay? So to get the size of the next chunk, you look at how many iterations there are left, then divide by the number of threads, and then divide again by two, and that's the number of iterations in the next chunk. So in this case, we can also specify a chunk size, but its meaning here is, uh, is, is less important. All it does is it specifies the minimum size of the chunks. Okay? And again, if we don't specify it, it, it defaults to one. So let's look at the uh, dynamic and guided in my same loop with 46 iterations. So if I specify a schedule of as dynamic three, then I'm going to divide the iterations up into chunks of three. So the first three iterations go to thread zero, the next three to thread one, and then so on. Um, and then suppose that uh, thread two, so that's the black, thread here, the black block. Suppose that's the first one to finish. It will pick up the next block of uh, the next chunk of iterations in turn. Uh, and then the gray thread finishes, so it picks up the next one. So whichever thread finishes first, it picks up the next chunk of iterations um, and so on until they're all finished. So that might mean, so for example, that, uh, that, that two consecutive chunks get executed by the same thread or so anything might happen. So you don't know what, uh, what order they're, they're going, to, going to get executed in. Okay, and again, the, uh, the last chunk may be short because, because things don't divide nicely. For guided schedule, so, um, that's again, so we get first come first served, but what happens is that the chunks start off large at the beginning and then they get progressively smaller and smaller towards the end, um, but they don't get smaller than the value of the chunk size. So the smallest chunks are size three here, again, except possibly the last one because of the, because of the remainder. Okay, so we've so far we've covered static, dynamic, and guided. Um, the last one is auto, and auto is just a way of saying, okay, um, I will just allow the OpenMP runtime to have full freedom to choose whatever it likes to do with assigning iterations to threads. Um, and so this, this is a couple of um, use case uses for this. So um, it allows, for example, the runtime to be potentially be clever and uh, and learn something about the load balance in a loop if it's executed um, many times over. It also allow it's also a mechanism to allow implementations to implement some other uh, scheduling algorithm apart from the uh, the static, dynamic, and guided ones. So some implementations use this to implement a, um, different loop schedules. Then the final one, which I haven't talked about, is runtime. So that's not a sep no, it's not really a separate option. What that does is it allows you to specify the scheduling type. So one of the first four, in other words, through an environment variable. So rather than have the schedule type specified in the code, 
it allows you to set it as an environment variable which is a convenient way mechanism if you want to run experiments to try out different scheduling options for a loop um, it allows you to do that without without recompiling your code um, but it's um, you know that's really a, it's, a, it's an option that you you should use during development uh, and not leave in in production code because you don't want to rely on whoever's using the code to 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 set the environment variable correctly so once you've figured out what a good option is then you should uh, put that in 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 the code that you uh, that you then ship okay so that's a lot of options so when should you use them okay so for the most part these uh, if your loop is load balanced so if every iteration takes the same amount of time to execute then just use static or the default behavior okay so because that has the least amount of overhead and if every iteration is taking the same amount of time then a more or less equal division will work fine and there won't be threads won't be idle waiting for for other threads to finish okay so static with a chunk size is good loop is good for loops which have some um, mild or smooth load imbalance uh, usually where the amount of work or the time that each iteration takes uh, to execute is somehow correlated with the iteration number um, it can however in, it can still induce some overheads so it may be that choosing your chunk size as one is not the best option you may need to experiment and uh, to determine what the optimal optimal chunk size is so uh, you know a chunk size of one would uh, intuitively give you the best load balance but because of the other overheads that can come in uh, from from that it, it may not be the optimal solution dynamic is typically useful if your iterations have really widely varying loads you know so for example if uh, you know if some iterations take a hundred or a thousand times longer than other iterations then this gives you the really the best chance of, of balancing the load um, it does have more overhead than static and the other problem that you get here is that it, it tends to ruin your data locality because you don't know which threads going to it going to access uh, you don't know which threads going to execute which iteration uh, and it may be different if you run the loop multiple times the assignment maybe may change um, and therefore you don't know which threads going to access what data so um, if your um, if data locality is important in your in your loop then dynamic is may, may not be a good choice guided is can, is supposed to be a, a sort of compromise um, so it, it's less expensive in the dynamic in terms of its overheads um, but there are cases so if, uh, particularly where the first iterations are the most expensive there are cases where it won't work well okay so if you're if the early iterations in the loop are the, are the most expensive then they will get assigned in one big chunk uh, and it may turn out that that chunk takes longer to execute than all of the rest of the loop put together Um, let's say auto may be useful if the if the loops executed many times over or it might be useful if you want to exploit uh, an implementation implementation dependent behavior for a, for a particular compiler here okay so that's that's the basics of of loops so uh, so when you come to do the practical exercises um, you can then so having done the uh, what I encourage you to do is to you know to solve the Mandelbrot set problem just using a parallel region um, and and then after, once you've done that 
then you can go back and 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 solve it using a loop directive and uh, you'll you'll find that that's much much cleaner and easier um, but it allows you to compare the two methods and hopefully to uh, give you an understanding of, of of what the uh what the loop directive is, is really doing underneath okay so we'll move on now and talk about the uh other work sharing directives. So the next one up is, is, is single. So this is uh, to indicate that a block of code is to be executed by a single thread only. So remember, we're, we're inside a parallel region. By default, every thread is executing all the code. Sometimes that's not what we want. Um, and we don't want to uh, close down the parallel region and start it up again. We just want a piece of code inside the parallel region be executed by one thread. So that's what the single directive does. It indicates a block of code to be executed by a single thread only. Um, so the way this works is that the first thread to reach the single directive will execute the block. Okay, so not all the threads might get there at the same time. So the first one that gets there executes the block of code. All the other threads skip over the block, uh, and then there's a synchronization point at the end. All the threads wait until the block has been executed. Um, again, that's the default, but that this synchronization is the default behavior, uh, same as with the parallel loops but there is a mechanism for, for uh, getting rid of that synchronization point if you, if you want to. No real surprises with the syntax, OMP single, uh, and then a, then a block of code. So uh, there's a few use cases for this. Um, what I'm thinking about here is that at some point in the middle of a parallel region, you want to, to read um, some input from a file. So I've got a parallel region. So all threads to execute some setup function, which involves some, um, some data structure X, some variable X. Then I want all one of the threads to read y from a file inside the input function uh, and then all the threads to be able to use both both x and y in in the subsequent work function so this is the way to do it in, in openmp or one, one way to achieve this is so i've got a parallel region so all the threads to call setup and then the first thread that finishes setup will call input. All the other threads will wait until input has finished. So this is the synchronization point at the end of the single region. Uh, once that's happened, all the threads then, then carry on and, and execute work. Um, so yeah, you can have um, private and first private clauses on single, not often used. And uh, as with a lot of OpenMP directives, the the, uh, the it, it must be a structured block. So that what does that mean? It really means that you can't arbitrarily branch into or out of it. The control flow must go in at the top of that block and exit at the bottom, and you can't jump out in in the middle. And then finally, we have the master directive. So this is similar, but subtly different. Um, it's again, one of those slight quirks that crept in at the in the early days of OpenMP and has has stayed there. And it's it's not particularly harmful as long as you as long as you remember. So this is different from single in the sense that it indicates that a block of code should be executed by the master thread only. 
So it's not the first thread that gets there, it's always thread zero executes this block of code. But um, it's different from single in that there is no implied synchronization at the end of the block. Um, so the other threads skip the block and carry on executing. Um, so there's this slightly weird uh, asymmetry between these, these two directives. Uh, uh, so again, you can, uh, we'll talk about this next time, um, you, can, you can code an explicit synchronization at the end. So single, the synchronization is there by default, but you can get rid of it. With master, synchronization is not there by default, but you can add it. So um, you can always get a synchronized version and a non-synchronized version, but the default behavior is the opposite way around, which is slightly annoying and confusing potentially. Okay, and again, uh, no surprises with the with the syntax. Okay, um, so the associated exercise for this is basically, yeah, go back and redo the, the Mandelbrot example using using a work sharing do or for directive. And I really would encourage you to do it in the order that I suggest. Do the, parallel, the, the plain old parallel region with the runtime library functions first, uh, and then try it with the, with the work sharing directive. Um, I think that's um, it's more instructive and to, to do it that way around. So I'd encourage you to do that. Okay, great. Um, do we have any questions about that? So the question says, if we have a variable defined before a parallel region, it's not used in the parallel region, should you declare them as shared? If then, if it's not used in the parallel region, then you don't need to specify it at all. Okay? So the only things that you need to specify as shared, private, first private, or reduction are variables that are actually accessed inside the parallel region. So if it's not used in the parallel region, then you can just simply omit it from the, uh, the list of, uh, of, of variables. So a kind of related point here is that if uh, so, if uh, a variable is used in a parallel region but in, a, a, in as read only, so it's not modified, then yes, declaring as that shared will save memory rather than making private copies. So you know if something's read only, then either shared or private will give you the will both give you the correct behavior, but first private costs something for allocating and making the copies. Um, if it's just scalars, then it really probably doesn't matter. The overhead is pretty tiny. Um, but if they, are, if they are arrays, then that can start to get expensive. So um, you can, you're both wasting memory in allocating private copies of arrays you're also wasting time in in actually making the, the the copies of the values as well okay so in case anybody else is still thinking of some questions so we just mentioned that please yeah uh, please get yourselves on on the machine and uh, and do some practical exercises there's you know the, there's there's no better way to to um, to learn this stuff than by by actually doing it for real. Um, and if you're having any problems, or any questions, then please post on the uh, on on the Dropbox page that's that's linked off the uh, off the course pages. Okay, so it doesn't look like we have any more questions for today. So if you do think of something, then uh, yeah, say please post on the on the Dropbox page. Um, and you know, have a have a go on the uh, with, with the practical exercises. Um, otherwise, I'll uh, talk talk to you again next week. Um, thank you very much for listening.